Chapter four, growth, diversity, and conflict, 1720, 1763. So we're, we're in the era that precedes the, the uh, American Revolution. So we're kind of heading that way. So always look at your title, try to determine what the chapter is about. Growth, diversity, conflict. We'll see that the population explodes. That creates diversity. That creates conflict. Okay. Okay. So um, the population is growing out of control like a weed. We don't think of the 1700s as being like that, but it, but it was. Um, and, and we talked about these three races that, that came to it, the Americas. Uh, one was here. Europeans came, brought Africans with them, and how they how they had these these conflicts and how they they had these challenges of, of interacting with the, with with each other. Uh, but the growth we're talking about in this chapter is mostly from white people coming from Europe, same race but different cultures, different languages, different religions, customs, and you know, suddenly Catholicism and Judaism is, a, is in a large portion of the population of these colonies. You hadn't had that before. It was mostly a white Protestant colony when it first started. You know, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, and so on. So now you, now you got this different point of view. So the conflict part is that. It's, it's, it's white on white conflict. It's not, not an ethnocentric white thing against non-white people we talked about. This is white on white conflict. So why do they come? It's, it's this endless land, seemingly anyway. But but if you look at the map on the left here, the English colonies are on the eastern coast here, and you have these Appalachian Mountains. So of course, n nothing compared to the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas of the west. But if you look, the, the only real mountain chain in the entire eastern half of the what would become the United States is the Appalachian Mountains. So. The colonies were on the east side and somewhat hemmed in by these mountains. They couldn't get over them very easily. There was no, there was no planes and trains and cars, and there wasn't even a road over over the mountains when they first started. So the, so the mountains somewhat was a kind of hemmed them in against the coast, and the only, only way to get around them would be to go way south and around. And of course, most of the population was too far north for that. So what happened is, as the people came to the English colonies, English people. They became very, very overpopulated and, um, you know, it was like sardines. So this is the issue. The, the colony has to spread out, okay? They, they've got to cross those mountains and get over here where all this, uh, I, I hate to say empty land, but you know what I'm saying. There's people living there, but, of course, the Europeans considered it to be empty, but sparsely populated. But this was this was French land, and we'll talk about that later. The French have all all the lands along the St. Lawrence River here, the Great Lakes, and down the Mississippi to New Orleans. Most of this is all French land. The French don't want the English to come over, so you're gonna have you, this is the conflict part of this chapter also. Uh, okay, so the English released 200,000 acres of land in the in the interior on the west side of the Appalachians. Uh, in what today would be Ohio. So the Ohio Company of Virginia released land for English settlement in this area right here where, where Ohio is today. This is on make the French very happy. They get worked up about this. So they begin to build a string of forts in the Ohio Valley to prepare to defend itself. These, these English people are coming and we need to be prepared. Okay, so by, by this time, England realizes that their confrontation against the French needs to happen because the colonists need to spread out and ease the tension from overcrowding that was occurring. Uh, so, so because of that, it's, it becomes, it became more of, more of an, of, more of an inevitability that the English and French would clash. Okay. You're going to have a, you're going to have a war. Okay. But before the people came to the new world, uh, people in Europe, white people in Europe, for the most part, most were tenant farmers. Uh, they, they didn't own their own land. Most people would never own their own land. 75% of the land was owned by the nobility, and a large percentage of what was left was, was unusable. So land was very valuable in Europe, and there was very little of it available, especially if you were a common person you know, on the on the lower end of the pyramid, uh, the people at the top of the pyramid had all had all the wealth and all the land. Okay, 
Uh, so this is one of those push factors. You know, this this lack of land is pushing you out of Europe, and available land is pulling you to, to Europe. So push pull factors. <clears throat> And they came, and they came by the droves, and they set up yeoman farming communities. So what's a yeoman farmer? Uh, they owned their own small farm, worked it with family labor, kind of like the ideal American. And here you see the, the, the guy changes from a farmer to a to militia. And this is, this is the ideal American, the honest, virtuous, hardworking, independent. If need be, I'll throw my pitchfork down and pick up a musket to defend my community, okay? Um, yeoman farmers were central to the Republican vision of the new nation, uh, and a, a yeoman farmer did not did not need large numbers of other laborers like slaves because they owned their own property, and they were seen as citizens that had political influence, and their family worked the farm. And, and this is another reason why, in this era, pe people had so many children is more more hands to work the farm. Uh, you've also got the Puritans in this era. And they're they're very influential. They they still have an influence on American culture today. Uh, patriarchal, male dominated. Uh, Puritan women did not have social equality. This is a quote from your book. <clears throat> Since he is thy husband, God has made him the head and set him above thee. So a woman's duty was to love and revere her husband, and was subordinate to him in every facet of life. She would. She would bear children, five to seven usually, uh, even more in some cases. She was not she was not considered equal in the church. She didn't, didn't have a voice in the church. Of course, the church was the entire backbone of the community. Uh, but Puritan men came to to escape the the restrictions of Europe, the landlessness, because without land, you had very little, and it lessened your chances of getting ahead. You couldn't do that in Europe. Let's let's go to the New World. Let's go to the Americas. Uh, of course, when they came and, and were able to secure some land, land ownership was a new thing for them. Uh, they never had it before. So they became very uh, interested and motivated to create a self-sufficient farm for themselves and their family. And this is called competency, the ability of a family to keep a household solvent, so it's making money, or it's not in debt, I should say, and independent. But more importantly, to pass that ability on to their next generation, so that these farms will be handed down generation after generation, and they're and they're self-sufficient. <clears throat> they don't need anybody else. They can they can grow food, raise cattle. They, they can manufacture what they need. They don't need anybody else. But this this is the ideal. <clears throat> uh, they're also called freeholders, <clears throat> or or a freehold. What what's a freehold? Uh, a freehold is lands that are owned in their entirety without feudal dues or ob obligations to any landlord. They have the legal right to improve, transfer, or sell the land. So this is a system that's similar to what we have today. I, I would say this is the beginning of it. Although the difference is few people today own their properties outright. Uh, we carry mortgages and loans that, 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 that we pay on. It's secured by a lien on the property, usually cash. So I mentioned the word feudal. What does is, what is feudal mean? The system of political organization that prevailed in Europe from the 9th to about the 15th centuries, having as its basis the relation of lord to vassals. So the important thing to understand about, about this is this is what people wanted to escape. Why millions came and left Europe to come to the Americas? Because they didn't want to be under the thumb of a king or a monarch or a, or a lord in this feudal <clears throat> system. So this this system is was um, very oppressive. So looking at this, this is their their pyramid. Essentially, the king's at the top, and it comes down tier by tier to the bottom is the serf. So the people at the bottom were the vast majority of the people, but they had nothing. The king at the top had everything, but right below the king is the lords, uh, the the lords who were considered to be vassals to the king. Okay, so you're 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 subjective to what the king king wants from you so you, you, you look at the arrows here so the king would give the lords a fife which is a, a land grant a fife and peasants to work it they, they, that would be given to the lords in return the, lo the lords would give them their loyalty and military aid so when i say military aid i don't mean that they're going to go and, and jump in the fray and, and fight they're going to get these people down here to do it for them but the, but the king ex expects to be 
uh, you know, get get aid in, uh, militarily if if necessary. Uh, then below the lords are the knights. So the knights are vassals of the lords. Okay, uh, connected. They they have agreements. I'm going to share one with you here in a few minutes. So the lords, after getting a fly from the peasants from the king, they would then pass down to the to the knights food, protection, shelter, and in return, the knights would get them homage and military service. Now the, these knights would fight in battle, but the the trench work, you know the the uh, front lines would be these people, okay? Uh, and then finally, the knights would give to the, the peasants protection, food, and shelter. Uh, in return, uh, the peasants would farm the land and pay rent. But what it doesn't say is military service. Again, these people would be the the what, what's called cannon fodder, you people that are just sacrificed in a, in a war. It's the commanders know it's going to happen. The, the, the guys in the front line are going to get wiped out. You have to have a lot of these men because you got to replace them. They're killed instantly. That's who these people were. So this is the this is the system of Europe oppressive, and it doesn't give the majority of people at the bottom uh, much chance at all. I mean, a, a a peasant might be able to move up to be a knight. But not very often would he go all the way to lords, and knights becoming lords was, was rare also. So a vassal, just so you understand, a vassal is a person who held land from a feudal a lord, uh, uh, received protection in return for homage and allegiance. So, so not, not really a slave, but a subordinate or dependent. So if you were a vassal to somebody, you were beneath them, and they expected things from you, okay? Let's watch a short film. It's going to go over this this pyramid again, but kind of put it into a better perspective. Please watch the film entitled Feudalism in Medieval, Medieval Europe, a Simple Explanation. Okay, so I mentioned that these people have had uh, pledges and agreements with each other, and they can be very complicated. I'm going to share one with you. Uh, try, to, try to figure out as I read this what exactly is going on. I, John of Toll, make it known that I am the faithful man of the Lady Beatrice, Countess of Troyes, and of my most dear Lord Theobald, Count of Champagne, her son, against all persons living or dead, except for my allegiance to Lord Angerland of Calci, Lord John of Arsis, and the Count of Grand Pre. Let me take a break here for a minute. <sighs> Kind of long-winded. If it should happen that the Count of Grand Pre should be at war with the Countess and Count of Champagne on his own quarrel, I will aid the Count of Grand Pre in my own person and will send to the Count and Countess of Champagne the knights whose service I owe them for the fife which I hold of them. So what exactly is he saying here? He's saying that if there's a conflict between certain people, I'm going to fight for one side because that's 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 my agreement. That, that's my pledge. I'll fight for one side, uh, and I'm, but I'm going to send knights to the other side because I owe them too. Okay, so interesting, uh, very complicated pledges. So a vassal would be protected and in return would go to battle for them if necessary. So this is the European system. This is what people want to get away from, oppressive. Uh, they want to leave Europe severe restrictions and unjust treatment. They want to own their own land and outright and, and – um, because they knew that, the, that if they could own their own land, that's a big start that could result in future wealth. But of course, understand that this, this idea was only available to white people. Non-white people weren't getting any opportunity to own land in the new world in, in, this, in this era. <clears throat> but the population grew so rapidly that land became scarce. Uh, so suddenly a uh, tract of land, you wanted to buy one, they became, they became smaller. There wasn't enough to go around. <clears throat> um, the less less land, you know, caused children to look for other opportunities because they they knew that they probably wouldn't inherit this land one day. Uh, and it's interesting. Uh, many many young people would force a marriage by by having premarital sex that results in a pregnancy just to get away from their from their parents and get away from that 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 uh, idea of of being part of that of that land. Um, they want to do their own thing because they. There's no opportunity here. This is also the era where birth control starts to become an option, although not hugely popular. You can start to see it here. 
um, the idea of limiting the size of the family became became more important now because we can't afford seven children and we can only afford two, so birth control. Uh, so the population in British North America is exploding. 1720, 400,000, 1765, <clears throat> 2 million. Five times growth in 45 years. That's that's tremendous. So it changed the way these yeoman farmers did their daily uh, routine. Not so self-sufficient anymore. They, they didn't have enough land to do it. So you start to exchange goods and labor with others to survive on your land. So you start to become neighborly and neighbors come together and it becomes a very American ideal in, in the, on the frontier to neighbors come out, the men come out to, um, you know, uh, uh, clear a field to, to plant or to build a house. The women are, are, are cooking meals for the men. This becomes a very American idea. It's called household mode of production. But it's all because the land's getting smaller because there because there's too many people, and, and they and they keep on coming, uh, all different types of people, different languages. So this this creates problems, different religions, and, and, and it never really stopped. And you could argue that it's still going on. Uh, understand that as far as non-white people, who this affects mostly is the Native Americans because this is all their land. This this used to be theirs. They're being pushed out and pushed out further and further. Their um, deaths from disease, you know, uh, does not help them to mount defense. They can't stop it. They are absolutely pushed out. But of course, as these farms uh, become settled and grow, you also have slaves come in, uh, you know, to to do the labor. Uh, okay, so you have this 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 culture changes from white Protestant to very mixed, even though all white people very mixed. And in some cases, you do have people that want to try to re-implement the, the uh, manor system with the lords and the, the feudalism in, in the Americas. Um, you know, uh, the uh, neo-European uh, uh, qualities we talked about early, it, it's just human nature to want to replicate where you came from. So some people tried to do this, where you create these huge estates and manors on the Hudson River, upstate New York, above New York City, and uh, you know the the patron would be the the owner of the big house, and all the people around his manor would work for him, just just like the feudal system. Uh, this didn't take, and it's interesting, you know, as you as you study American history, there's more than one time when someone tries to recreate the European model, uh, and and. And for a short time, perhaps they're they're uh, successful. But it's interesting how the people that came to America, even before they were Americans, uh, you know, the country of the United States, they they tend to resist going back to the European ways vehemently. Any, any chance they have to do that, they know we're not going to do that. So, not being uh, like Europe, uh, although they replicated the communities, but as far as culture and individual rights, the people that came to the Americas were always different and always about not doing that way, not, not doing it the European way. Um, some of these houses or these manors are still there. You can, I've seen these. You can visit these in upstate New York. I, it's, it's interesting to see. Uh, we, you've also got people that don't have land. And you, you really got to have land to survive in this era. Uh, it's about agriculture. So squatters are somebody that just takes over a piece of land and they squat on it. They don't leave, and they they say, "Well, this is where this we're going to work this land." Uh, and some of them would end up owning this land, this land that, that, that originally wasn't theirs. Uh, you've got people called redemptioners. Uh, a redemptioner is like an indentured servant, but a redemptioner is already in America. You don't have to be brought over, you know, the overseas voice. So, so if you recall, the indentured servant. A person would pay their passage to then get them get their indentured contract for five seven years. A redemptioner is already here, so of course you could you can negotiate better terms with a with a with a person to work for when you're already here. They don't have to pay that that passage. Okay, um, so all this is going on in America while in Europe the Enlightenment's going on. So this is a this is a monumental moment in in world history. 
and the, the doorstep of the modern world is the enlightenment coming out of the dark middle ages uh you know uh, since the fall of rome in the fifth century you know we've talked about it a little bit viewed by history as a troubled period marked by the loss of classical learning era of ignorance superstition uh social chaos repression people believed in 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 uh folk wisdom and magical powers so you have a loss of science and learning and education like you've seen with the Romans and Greeks centuries back. Then you have this scientific revolution in the 16th century challenged the old ways. Suddenly you have scientific explanations about the universe and mathematics. It changed the way people felt about the world and themselves. Uh, let's take our next break and watch uh, the next film. This is a short film that looks at this new ideology called the Enlightenment and looks at some of its thinkers and philosophers. Go ahead and watch the film, The Enlightenment, Part 1. Okay, so the Enlightenment has four principles. Uh, number one, the law-like order of the natural world. So the, the natural world, meaning Earth and, and its and its environs, it, it, it's there's an order to it. It, it doesn't happen because of a of a supernatural being making it happen, whether it's a god or gods, the natural world exists and and uh, pr uh, progresses and evolves on its own. Number two is the power of human reason, the idea that, uh, that people can think for themselves and not have to rely always on faith for answers. That's not an indictment against faith, but it's it's the idea that you can you can answer a lot of a lot of the questions posed to a human by just by just reflecting. And, and thinking about it yourself, pondering and thinking about it yourself. The natural rights of individual, this, this is a, this is a you know, unique idea because individuals didn't have natural rights. What are natural rights? We're gonna talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but the idea that everybody had natural rights was not being done in any level in Europe. And number four, the progressive improvement of society. That society should should evolve and progress and not get stuck in the mire like, like it had done for nearly a thousand years in the Middle Ages. It it, it needs to evolve and, and and keep getting better. Okay. So one of the important uh, Enlightenment thinkers uh, for this class anyway uh, is John Locke. So I say this class because it's an American history class. And even though he's English and a philosopher, and I don't think he I don't know if he ever came to America. I, I, I doubt he did. He is hugely influential on how uh, the United States of America was was built. Uh, <clears throat> he he wrote a couple of essays. Uh, the essay concerning human understanding, where he determines that life and its future is not preordained. It can be changed by education, rational thought, pur purposeful action. So, of course, the peers are saying, what are you talking about? It, we believe in predestination. God's determined which one of us is going to heaven and which one of us is not. Now, you're saying that life in its future is not preordained. This, this, this is radical, and uh, you know, some people call him a heretic. This, is, this, this goes against tradition. Uh, in, his, in his pamphlet entitled Two Treatises on Government, both were written in 1690, he rejected the idea of a divine right to the monarchy. Uh, he says that, that, that rule was not a God-given right. That, that had always been the way people thought in Europe. The king was ordained by God to, to rule, and his son, no matter how you know, uh, uh, enable he might be, he, he might be the worst ruler on the planet. You'd never vote for that guy, but it didn't matter because he's the son's, I'm sorry, he's the king's son. So he gets there anyway. So you have you have a that's part of the problem with the Middle Ages. You have got a lot of people who are rulers that have no no business being rulers. Most of them were very, you know, kind of spoiled, uh, e e elitist and privileged, and only cared about themselves. That that's not proper proper leading of a, of a country. Okay. So John Locke comes up with these natural rights that the, the four uh, principles mention. And so what are the are the natural rights of, of people? Uh, I'm sorry. Here, here's a here's a uh, slide that shows you the two uh, the two essays that he wrote, uh, an essay concerning human understanding and two treatises on of government. Okay, um, John Locke believed people had natural rights to life, liberty, and property. So that kind of might sound sound familiar to some of you. Those words would inspire Thomas Jefferson, 
a hundred or so years later when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, but he changed it to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So why do you think he did that? Well, I, I don't think Jefferson was, was too excited about saying that people had natural rights to property. Yeah, he, he probably wanted it all for himself. Most of the founding fathers were, were big on having massive tracts of, of land and property. So perhaps that's why. Um, but John Locke inspired Jefferson to, to write these, you know, hallowed words of American history. So John Locke's instrumental in inspiring some of America's core values. You know, people, people ask me, isn't it true that the colonies were, you know, um, a Christian colony, that it was designed to be that, and the people that came here were, were Christians trying to escape, you know, the, the persecutions of Europe. And that's partly true. I mean, the, the Puritans, pilgrims, without question. But, but typically, I would say overall, no. Most of the colonies were business um, opportunities. Uh, and this, as far as the religious belief, many people, including very famous founding fathers, believe in what's called deism, the belief based solely on reason in a God who created the universe and then abandoned it, assuming no control over life, <laughs> exerting no influence on natural phenomena and giving no supernatural revelation. So I'm not, I'm not sure if abandon it is, the, is how, I would, how I would define that, but, but essentially God created the world, uh, but left it to run according to natural laws, it, it, natural laws of of the natural world and natural rights of the human world. And he was not going to intervene and and do anything to to change the course of, of or direction of people on, on the planet. He just made it and let the people run it themselves. So this was popular. George Washington was a deist. Many many of the founding fathers were. Uh, so it, it's it's a it's it's not a complete it's not completely accurate to suggest that the the entirety of the colonies were were you know based on Christian principles. Some of them were, most of them were business opportunities. And as far as religious thought, probably the most popular belief system was deism. Okay, so. The Enlightenment is a direct kind of uh, uh, assault on religion in some way. Religions, religious leaders felt challenged by these new ideas, science. And the reason why the sun sets and is because of science. And you, you, can, you can come up with an explanation for why anything happens. Nothing's just by chance. Uh, so religious leaders protest this. And they react to the Enlightenment and all this new scientific knowledge. There's a religious revival. You have a time of reawakened interest in religion, and this happens throughout history. You know, when, 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 uh, when there's somewhat of a scientific era, uh, or a secular era, let's say the 60s and 70s of the 1900s, um, you know, were a secular era of people protesting and, and fighting against the government, that's replaced in the 1980s by a kind of the religious right. And so this, this seems, this tends to happen in history where religion is never, never crushed by this. It actually rises because, because of it. They have a revival movement called pietism, uh, being pious. A revival is a meeting or series of meetings for the purpose of reawakening religious faith. And you see the, the image here, characterized by impassioned preaching and public testimony. Uh, it's kind of tr trying to restore, you know, a, a restoration to validity of something that they felt had lapsed. Going back to the old, let, let's let's find our, our religion and 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 you know reinvent it. So so piet pietism emphasizes pious behavior. Pious means devoted to the observance of religion, reverent or devout. <clears throat> done for the benefit of others, or with the intention of encouraging good. So this, this awakening, uh, this, this kind of uh, revival of religion, uh, historians call it today the Great Awakening. They didn't call it that then, but, but, but this is what we call it from today's time to, to categorize. There's actually two of these that happened in American history. This is the first one, uh, 1730s to the 1770s. Of course, the revolution comes along and changes everybody's points of view. 
Uh, so a revitalization of religious piety that swept through the American colonies and the evangelical upsurge taking place in England, Scotland, and Germany. So a new age of faith rose to counter the currents of the age of the Enlightenment and to, to, to reaffirm the view that being truly religious meant trusting your heart, not your head, relying on feeling more than thinking relying on biblical revelation rather than human reason or science. So this religious enthusiasm spread quickly, and by the 1740s, these revivals were being conducted everywhere. And these are emotionally charged sermons, and they evoked vivid, terrifying images about the utter corruption of human nature and the terrors awaiting the unrepentant in hell. This is kind of the, the fire and brimstone era of, of religion. Um, uh, today we're much nicer in understanding about religion, and people see it that way. But back then, it was it was about fear. But very popular drawing eyes is so large that people had to preach outdoors. And you see the man there. He, there's not a building around that could house all those people to see him, but they built a temporary stage, and and he he'd give his sermon. Uh, George Whitefield is one of the more popular uh, speakers of that day evangelist. He, he led a movement to reform the Church of England. I like the Puritans, a um, similar attempt to purify the church. Uh, George Whitefield and his beliefs and his followers resulted in the founding of the Methodist Church late in the 18th century. So Whitefield preached everywhere in the colonies, uh, and according to uh, Whitefield, sinful men and women were dependent for salvation on the mercy of a pure, all-powerful God he would gesture dramatically. He would weep openly, thundering out threats of hellfire and brimstone. He turned his sermons into gripping theatrical performances. Okay, this 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 led to a split in the religious community. You have the old lights, kind of the, the way it had been, and the new lights. So the the old lights, conservative ministers opposed to the passion displayed by these new evangelical preachers. They, pre they preferred to emphasize the importance of cultivating a virtuous Christian life. They had a rational appeal. Their ministry was educated, and they typically catered to the established privileged classes. Okay, But the New Lights, these new evangelical preachers, they preached about a Christian faith that was intellectual and emphasized spiritual rebirth. So they, they had an emotional appeal. Uh, they had a converted ministry. You, you, you could convert yourself and become a minister. And they typically catered to the dispossessed classes, the, the, the lower of the pyramid, okay? So all this is going on in this colony as it's, as it's growing and evolving. But I mentioned that the conflicts of the French and the, and the English, and so it's about land. It's about the English getting across the mountains and getting that land. So you have a series of what are called the French and Indian Wars. So I understand it's kind of an odd name. It'd be like calling World War II, if you're an American, the Japanese and German War. The, the French and the Indians are who you fought, okay? Um, so this, so this, this is pretty much bound to happen. Um, so we talked about the English have all the people much more popular, but but hemmed in by the Appalachian Mountains like sardines along the coast. The French were much less popular, but they had all that land, and they had all this, uh, the strategic waterways. They could get from the North Atlantic to the Gulf of Mexico almost by waterway. You can come in the St. Lawrence River, northern Canada, and go all the way to New Orleans almost completely by water. <clears throat> So the French and Indian Wars were, were a competition for control of the continent that would last 75 years, and they would fight four wars in that time, okay? So I'm going to briefly share with you the first three. Um, I'm not going to test you on the first three. Um, you will be tested on the fourth one. The fourth one is very important. But just to keep our story together here, I'm just going to briefly tell you what the, what the first three were about, okay? So for the most part, these were, these were frontier raids, mostly in New York, part of New England. So King William's War... Uh, 1689, 1697, about eight years. This is when it starts, and you have these frontier raids. Now, now, now understand, there have been frontier raids long before the war and long after all these wars until the last one. But 
there wasn't a, a declared war. Okay, so King William's War is his first battle. Uh, then you have about five years uh, uh, break, and you have Queen Anne's War, 1702-1713, bloody fighting across the entire frontier again. So the European diplomats at that time were more concerned with the balance of power in Europe uh, than the military situation in in North America, so they 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 weren't concerned so much about what's going on over, over here in the New World. That they they had their own their own issues. So these wars were mostly skirmishes and raids between militia and and the French, English militia and the French. Okay. Um, okay, and and mostly happening in in upstate New York. This is a present day map of New York, but just try to illustrate the area I'm talking about. So New York City's down here. The the Hudson River goes all the way up up into the Lake Champlain, Lake George area. So you've got waterways all through here. Albany was the furthest north uh, English colony at that time. I know we've talked about this. Is this is review? Uh, so this is the frontier, and the frontier is the land between the colonists and the and the native americans okay but over here we talked about the iroquois they are here and of course allied with the english but so most of these the, the raids in the first three wars were all done here uh the french and their canadian native allies coming down and raiding and and of course vice versa the english with their with their uh native allies coming north and and some atrocities being committed on both sides, okay. Okay, the third war is King George's War. So you actually have a um, a uh, thirty-one year uh, period of peace, <clears throat> but no, not 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 really. It, 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 even though there's there's no war uh, declared, you still have these raids that go on, skirmishes go on. They, they went on for seventy-five years. So uh, so King King George's War again characterized by Bloody border raids by both sides, with the aid of each side's Indian Indian allies. <clears throat> uh, not to suggest there wasn't anything else going on. There, there were some battles on the coast in the uh, in the uh, eastern Canada and in northern New England, um, but most of the time trying to get access and control the St. Lawrence River. But each time the war would end, the, the lands would go back to where they had been before the war. So. Um, Anyway, so these three wars go on, and but it's it's they, they don't accomplish a whole lot, a, a lot of death other than that. But as far as the future, they both know there's going to be a smackdown war here. There's going to be a final war that's going to determine who's going to uh, have possession of the of the Americas, either the English or the French. And that is our fourth war. So this 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 one you do need to know about. So you you, you do need to understand what's going on here. <clears throat> this is the one that's important for our purposes. The one that, that will end in the final defeat of France, and left Britain as the as the last one standing, and the European country that had finally gained control of North America from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River. Okay, please take a break here and watch the next film. And the title of the film is The French and Indian War Explained. Go ahead and watch that film and then come on back. Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture right here. Number five, this is called Young George Washington. Okay, so let's go to our outline. So we all know who George Washington is, but we tend to think of him as the old guy in the dollar bill. In fact, he was a very vibrant young man, six foot four, strapping guy, athletic, uh, the best horseman around. He, he was a action hero in, in his day. Okay, number one, introduction. The English released. Uh, let's just say 200,000 acres in Ohio Valley. Uh, and we've talked about that earlier. We'll talk about it more here. The French begin to build forts along the frontier. Uh, so please understand that, that that's 200,000, not 200. Okay, Washington. Who's Washington? He's an emissary for Dinwiddie. That's the governor of Virginia. He sent to survey forts. He attacks the French. A French commander is killed. Number three, Braddock, uh, general of the English army, arrives in parade fashion. But is ambushed and killed. Washington takes command. And what's the relevance of the lecture? Washington enters American history and will be an impactful figure for the next 50 years, all the way up to the start of the 19th century. 
But this foolish incident attacking the French sparked the Fourth French and Indian War, and that's kind of a story that we're talking about here. Okay, okay. So this 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 so let, let's go ahead and get started. This is where George Washington enters American history, the entrance of an American legend. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 21 years old when he's first seen in history. So I mentioned before how this this 200,000 acres, not 200, 200,000 acres for settlement was released by the Ohio Company of Virginia on the west side of the Appalachians. And of course, France took notice and began began to build force. They're very worried. You know, why are, why are they encroaching on our land? So so this this land would be today what what is the state of Ohio? Okay. So the French build these forts along the waterways, and you see Fort Duquesne, Fort Necessity, Fort Leboeuf, Fort Fanango, Niagara, all over, Oswego, Ticonderoga, they start to Stanwix. They build all these forts because they, they're concerned that the English are going to come. So they, they built forts for two things, to defend themselves and to stop English settlement. <clears throat> so the governor of Virginia, Governor Robert Dinwiddie, uh, he decides to I'm going to send an emissary, uh, someone that's going to take a message to somebody, let's say. I'm going to send this, this person out to the frontier, out to the French forts to ask the French to, to leave. We don't, you shouldn't be here. This is our land. <laughs> okay. So he decides to send Washington, a very young man, 21 years old. So Washington went with just one guy, and just, just he and one other person. <clears throat> And he gets out to the French forts, and they, of course, they're always very eloquent. Sit down, have some wine, have some dinner. How are you? But get the heck out of here. We're not, we're not leaving. Okay, we're not, we're not going anywhere. So they, so they politely tell Washington to get lost. So Washington, with his guide, come back to Virginia. Th this actually was a pretty harrowing uh, adventure for these two men, Washington, you see there, and his guide. Um, One thousand miles by horseback, foot, canoe. And a raft, round trip, 500 miles there, 500 miles back, it, over land that most white men hadn't really seen before. Uh, it took him 10 weeks. Uh, he survived an Indian attack. He almost drowned in the river. He was freezing cold a, a, a few times, and they both got lost a few times also. So an incredible journey. When Washington came back to Virginia to, to tell Dan Whitty that they aren't going to leave, he wrote up a a uh, a journal about about what he had experienced for the governor for Dinwiddie, like a, a report of his journey. But this became a uh, very popular and was published for the public. This is a book you can get in any library. Um, it's interesting, a very short um, book, but the kind of Washington's own words about what he and his guide went through in these ten weeks. So it became hugely popular. So he became hugely popular. He became like a like a legend, a hero, at, at a very young age. Uh, a few months later, um, Dinwiddie decides to send him back. This is later in 1754. There's a place in the on the frontier called the Forks of the Ohio. It's where, where three rivers come together: the Monongahela and the Allegheny rivers come. They, they come together in a junction. And that's the headwaters of the Ohio River, a very important river even today. Uh, so the so this this forts forts of the Ohio is where present day Pittsburgh is today. This would this was the this was the piece of land or the air that everybody wanted. If you could, if you control those three rivers, and they are all three right there, you would control the the back country. Dinwiddie knew that that Washington had also. He, he was a surveyor, and he knew how to measure out land. So he sends Washington out there again, go go back. But this time he had a platoon with him, not just two guys, and sur survey the land on the on the forks of the Ohio, uh, and determine if it's if it's possible to build a fort there. Okay, so here you see the the depiction of it in his day this is the this is the, the two rivers this is the Ohio River going going north here and this this picture here is the, is the building of the, of the first fort you came who later become Pittsburgh of course today this is the exact this is an actual picture of Pittsburgh today of course it's a, it's a metropolis today but this the city of Pittsburgh came out of this Fort Duquesne or would later be called Fort Pitt so when Washington goes he 
comes up to the forks and he's probably up on Mount Washington, the other side of the river, on the east side of the of the Monongahela River, and he looks down and he sees this. The French are already building a fort there. Washington was supposed to go there and survey it to, to build an English fort, but the French beat him to it. So Washington, he's only got a small amount of men. He's not going to go down there and challenge them. He just simply leaves. I, I'm going to have to go back and tell Dinwiddie that you can't can't build a fort there because they are, they're already building one. Uh, but on his way back, he, he found a group of French soldiers in, in camps. Now, they, they didn't have any pickets out, any guards out. They, they figured that they were out in the middle of nowhere and that no one was going to bother them. In, in fact, they were also emissaries heading towards the English. So they, they weren't challenging anybody or, you know, or, or, or being combative. But very foolishly, this, this is where Washington makes a huge mistake. Very foolishly, he decides to attack them by surprise. And he easily defeats them uh, because they were mostly sitting around having a cup of, cup of coffee. Okay, uh, they weren't expecting anybody to be in the neighborhood. Uh, so while they were negotiating for a surrender, and and this is kind of the English, I should say, European way. And we'll see more of this. We'll talk more about this. These these people were always eloquent to each other. The officers were 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 men of honor. You know, they they were usually from a you know a a a uh, family that was that was landed and, and had wealth and money and power so even though they they they're your adversary they didn't see them as enemies it, it was it was war was honorable and and men fought it to the best of their ability sometimes you lose sometimes you win so when you're negotiating for a surrender you typically would be very gracious to, to the defeated you you Put a table of food up and have some wine and sit down and and usually just compliment each other. Okay, so that so that that happens here. Washington is negotiating with the commander of that French uh, group, and they're being very nice to each other. Well, this this angers the the uh, Native Americans. They they didn't fight like that. This is your enemy. You defeated them. We should take their scalps and get. The prizes of war, or or booty, it's called. Not that kind of booty. Booty, booty means the prizes of war. Okay, take their stuff, take their scalps. You, you, why, why are you being nice to them? I mean, you, this is your enemy. You defeated them. So this 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 uh, this Native American um, uh, individual called Tenagrasim, or the Half King. Uh, he's watching. Now, now he's a he's a member of the Iroquois. Uh, he's a guide for for Washington, and he's watching this happen. He's watch he's watching Washington negotiating with a man named Ensign Jumonville, and he just gets angry at at all the niceties. He just get, picks up a club and 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 smacks Jumonville in the head and kills him. Uh, so Washington, of course, is in complete shock. This is a young man. This 21 year old man, never been in combat in his life. He's not used to these kind of things. He kind of panics. And the entire everyone's in disarray enough so that that a a French soldier was able to sneak out the back and run all the way back to Fort uh, Duquesne to alert the commander there that we've been attacked by an English detachment. Well, it turns out the commander of Fort Duquesne was the brother of Anson Jumonville, who Tenagrasin killed. So he he of course has has you know even more. You know, ambition to catch Washington. He, it's he 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 wants to, you know, um, uh, get revenge for for his brother uh, that was killed. So Washington finds out that the French are after him, and he goes on the run. And it's like a it's like a fox hunt. You got this huge French army chasing this small detachment of Englishmen with Washington in command. Washington is trying to trying to get away, but he he realizes we we can't possibly escape. So he stops and he tells his men to build a fort out of anything you could find. Just we we got to put up some kind of defense work here. This is called Fort Necessity, and that's a the, at the bottom on the right there is a modern day image of the fort itself. Of course, that's that's not the original, but it looks somewhat like that. Um, this this is they're, they're gonna they're gonna have to make a stand. Of course, the French come and it's not even close, and they're soundly defeated very quickly. And then surrendered terms are drawn up again. 
but now it's it's dark it's raining the surrender terms are written in french washington didn't speak french and there's they're pushing him sign it sign it sign it if you sign it you can go if you sign it you can take your, your sidearms and your horses and go and don't come back washington's you know like i don't understand it but i can't read it but okay i'll trust you i'll sign it and he does and so washington leaves with his men when they return to virginia Washington was told that the document he signed was a signed confession by Washington himself that said he assassinated the French leader. Um, of course, Washington's embarrassed and he claimed his innocence. I didn't do that, but the damage was done. This incident would spark a world war that would be called the Seven Years' War, um, but it's called the French and Indian War is what the American theater of it was called. This is our fourth our fourth French and Indian War. So don't be too concerned about the Seven Years' War. I'm not going to ask you a question about that, but this war would explode around the entire world, uh, be a, you know, like a world war, and it was called the Seven Years' War. So Washington, of course, goes from hero to zero, right? He was the, he was the action pack guy from before that was, you know, had this big, now he's made this, this huge blunder, okay? So the English are angry and, and they decide we're going to bring in the big guns and they bring a man called named Edward Braddock. This is an old school, grizzled, battle hardened uh, English general. And we're going to march on Fort Duquesne and crush them and take it for ourselves. OK, uh, <clears throat> this is a harsh, arrogant, old school guy. No nonsense guy. Uh, surprisingly, he asked Washington to be his second command. Well, because he'd been there twice, and so, so more of a guide uh, than second in command. But Washington, of course, is very happy to go to try to redeem himself. Okay, uh, so so Braddock determines we're gonna we're gonna march across this this trail and soundly defeat the French in, in short order. Now, understand when Washington went the first time, it was a, it was it was an old uh, Native American trail. Um, it got a little wider. When, when his um, uh, platoon went through, now you got an army coming through. So as they're, as they're going across the trail, Braddock is, is widening it to 10 feet or so so the wagons can get through. So this, this road's getting bigger and bigger. What's interesting about that is, is today it's Interstate 40, okay? It's a huge, uh, you know, a multi-lane uh, highway. It started as a, as a trail back in Washington's day. Okay, so... Um, Braddock feels so invincible that there's nobody going to stop us. He, he did not reconnoiter or inspect, observe, or survey the enemy. You, you send scouts ahead to see what's going on. If you have a large army, you, you want to know what's out there so you're not surprised. But uh, Braddock felt that he didn't have to do that. We're the big bad English with our red coats. We're going to march in, you know, in parade fashion, drums and fights announcing their entrance we're not going to sneak up that's that's not not what a man does that's not what a, what there's no honor in that um so this this is kind of the old school way of of of, of fighting um europeans uh battle a different kind of way okay um they they don't you're looking at the, at the images here they they would kind of line up against each other and just far away, where the natives were, you know, uh, hiding behind trees. They would they would kind of spy and look around and you make a make a determination about about what um, what they should do. Okay. Um, please take a break here, just 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 to kind of illustrate this this style of European warfare. Uh, please watch the film that is entitled uh, 18th century. I don't have the title in front of me, but European warfare, it's, it's, it's less than two. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think it just says, watch the first two minutes, uh, watch the first minute and a half is all you need, need to do. Just watch that. You, you'll see what I mean, how these, these great armies of Europeans march up and just face off in each other. And then, then they fire away with no chance of, of, you know, getting behind defense works. And they just, kind of massacre each other. So this is the old school way of, of battle that, of course, Braddock is bringing with him to the Pennsylvania frontier. Go ahead and watch that film and then come back. 
Okay, so so the Native Americans they they, they have no clue why why would these two enemies march into a battlefield like that in full view of each other and then line up and fire on each other? It doesn't make any sense. But again, that was the honorable way. But you see, the the French have been with the natives for a while now, and we talked before about how they had, they had a good relationship. So the Native Americans had taught the French to use the terrain as an advantage, hide behind rocks and trees, you know, sneak up, ambush. You don't have to always just show yourself. And and the French learned learned this new new style of of uh, of fighting. So while while this big army is marching on Fort Duquesne. Commander Jumonville says, you know, we're, we're small. They're going to crush us. <clears throat> we got to go out there and surprise them. That's, that's the only shot we have. So they do, and, and, they, and they line the trail, the, the road, on both sides, hiding, hiding in the trees and behind the rocks and quiet. And when the, when the army came into full view, you know, the full army's in front of them, they open fire and wipe them out. Very small detachment wipes out a much larger force because they ambushed. This this was dishonorable to the Europeans, but the Native Americans don't care. We're not here to be honored. We're here to defeat you. Okay. So war, warfare changes in this era. Although even even a hundred years later in the Civil War, you you'll still see this this type of thing going on in in the United States. So in this ambush, Braddock is killed, and Washington takes command. <clears throat> Uh, is in retreat. He he buries he buries. Oops, sorry, he buries Braddock in the road, <clears throat> so the natives would not find his his body. So they wouldn't, you know, dig it up and mutilate it, which was the native custom. And uh, so, so the wagons would drive over the grave, and and it would be marked. And this this grave would not be found until the uh, probably the last 30, 40 years. Um, okay, so. Washington comes back to Virginia again, uh, and of course he's got bad news to to for, for Dinwiddie again. I'm sorry, but we got crushed and Braddock's dead, and this French and Indian War is in full swing. Um, this fourth French and Indian War comes out of this <clears throat> out of these incidents. Okay, so the relevance of the supplemental lecture is Washington enters American history. And will be an impactful figure for the next 50 years, all the way to the start of the 19th century. But this foolish incident attacking the French sparked the Fourth French and Indian War. Okay. Okay, that is the end of that lecture. That is also the end of Chapter 4, Part 1. Please go on to Chapter 4, Part 2. Thank you.